Hi, welcome to Chapter 16, Covalent Bonding. I'm Jim Burnham. In our last chapter, we talked about ionic bonding and the properties of ionic substances. And in this chapter, we're going to deal with covalent bonding and covalent compounds, covalent molecules. So in this first section, we're going to talk about the nature of covalent bonding. We're going to use electron dot structures to show the formation of single, double, and triple covalent bonds. How does the diatomic molecule H2 form? The nuclei would repel each other. They want to stay as far away from each other as possible. But they are attracted, the nuclei, to electrons. And so they can share those electrons. Each hydrogen atom donates one electron, and they both end up sharing this common pair. And so this is what it looks like. In symbolic form. This is what's known as a covalent bond. This is different from ionic bonds. Remember, ionic bonds are when one electronegative element steals, pulls the electron completely away from a, another atom. So uh, sodium, for example, its single valence electron is pulled away by the chlorine to make sodium chloride, an ionic compound. And the chlorine has the full negative charge and the sodium has a positive charge and that's the bond is formed by the electrostatic uh, attraction well here these covalent bonds are formed by nonmetals and the nonmetals hold on to their valence electrons they can't give them away to make electrostatic bonds but like the ionic compounds everything still wants a noble gas configuration and they can get it if they share their valence electrons with each other. By sharing their valence electrons, both atoms get to count the electrons toward their own noble gas configuration. So for example, fluorine has seven, seven valence electrons, two, four, six, seven. If we have another fluorine atom, it also has seven. They both want a complete octet. Neither one will part with an electron. They're both very, you know, they both hang on to those. So how can they get to eight? Well, they can do it by sharing electrons. If they move closer and closer and closer together, then they can share this pair. And fluorine gets to count, this fluorine gets to count it as eight, and this fluorine gets to count it as eight. And so it forms this diatomic molecule. They both end up with full eight count orbitals. Okay? This one has eight valence electrons, this one has eight valence electrons. They're both happy. So a single covalent bond is the sharing of two valence electrons. This only happens with nonmetals and hydrogen. Remember, this is different from ionic bonds because they actually form molecules, independent units, not just a formula unit or a ratio of a, you know, of a, of a giant uh, lattice network, but two specific atoms are joined together. In an ionic solid, you can't tell which atom the electrons move from or to, but you can in a molecule. So we form them like a jigsaw puzzle. You put the pieces together to come up with the right formula. Carbon is a special example. It shares four electrons, and it does this with a thing called electron promotion. We'll talk about that maybe later. Um, water is a good example here. So each hydrogen has one valence electron, but it wants one more to get a duet. Oxygen has six valence electrons, but it wants two more to make its octet. And so they share to make each other happy. So in this case, one hydrogen shares its electron here with oxygen. So, they, so hydrogen gets to count these two, and it's happy. Oxygen has seven, but what's it want? It wants one more. It wants eight. So why not bring in another hydrogen and do the same thing? Now, once we attach the second hydrogen, Every atom has full energy levels. Hydrogen has its two each, and oxygen has its octet. Now, sometimes we can share, atoms can share more than one pair of valence electrons. So a double bond is when atoms share two pairs, or four total electrons. And a triple bond is when atoms share three pairs, six total pairs, six total electrons. Um, we need to know which elements are diatomic. Oxygen is one of those. Remember, have no fear of ice-cold beer. Those are our seven diatomic molecules. 
And so whenever they exist in molecular form, they're going to exist in this shared uh, covalent structure. They're going to share electrons to achieve uh, an octet. And this is a classic example of a covalent bond. Let's look at carbon dioxide. Carbon is the central atom uh, because it's more metallic. Carbon has four valence electrons and wants four more. Oxygen has six valence electrons and wants two more. So if we attach one oxygen, well, that's going to leave the oxygen one electron short. And the carbon is going to be left three electrons short, right? It went from four to five, but it wants to get to eight. So let's bring in another oxygen. Attach it the same way. Well, that still leaves both oxygen one electron short. And the carbon is now two electrons short. So how can we, how can we figure this out? How about let's share even more? Let's, instead of sharing just one pair, let's share a double pair. Let's form a double bond. So we'll take this electron, bring it in here, take this electron, bring it in here, and form a double bond. Wow, okay, so that now gives this oxygen eight and gives this carbon two, four, six, seven. So this has seven, this has seven. What if we do the same thing on this side? What if we bring this electron down here and this electron up here and form a second double bond on this side? And that's what we'll do. And now we have an octet on all four, all, all three atoms. This oxygen has its octet, two, four, six, eight. The carbon has two, four, six, eight. And this oxygen has two, four, six, eight. Every atom can count all the electrons in the bond uh, against its quartet, uh, the octet, against its octet. So this has an octet, carbon has an octet, this oxygen has an octet. And we did it by forming double bonds, double covalent bonds. Eight there, eight there, eight there. So how do we draw these? Well, the first thing to do is to add up all the valence electrons. Then count up the total number of electrons to make all the atoms happy. Then we divide, we subtract that. We subtract the total that we need from the, what we have, and we divide that number by two, and that'll tell us how many bonds, how many covalent bonds we need to make. We draw those bonds, then we fill up the rest of the valence electrons to fill the atoms up. Here's a practical example. So NH3 is ammonia. Uh, nitrogen has five valence electrons. It wants eight. Hydrogen has one valence electron, but with three of them, it wants three more. Okay, um, so so we're gonna it wants it wants a total of three. So what we have so we have what we have are five valence from the nitrogen and three like uh, uh, hydrogens. So that gives us is we have eight, but but NH three wants eight plus six. Right, eight eight for the uh, nitrogen. Six total for the hydrogens for a total of 18. So what's the difference? We take 14 minus 8, that gives us 6. We divide that by 2. That means we have to form three covalent bonds. So we have four atoms with three bonds. So we just start making that. We just start, we start uh, uh, stacking them up. So here we go. Make a bond, make a bond, make a bond, add the remaining electrons. And now everything has either its duet, if you're hydrogen, or its octet, if you're nitrogen. Everything is full. And here's another example, HCN. So carbon, again, is the central atom. Nitrogen has five valence electron, wants eight. Carbon has four, wants eight. Hydrogen has one, wants two. So the total that we have is 10, but the total that we want is eight plus eight plus two is 18. So the difference is eight, we divide that by two, it makes four bonds. So we're going to have three atoms with four bonds. So that's going to require a multiple bond, but that we can't make a multiple bond with hydrogen. Hydrogen only makes a single covalent bond. Then it's full. Then it's done. So we're going to have to have a single bond with carbon and hydrogen. And then, since we need four bonds total, we're going to have to create three bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen. Okay. So we start with a single bond. We need to add two more. They have to go here. So there they go. And now we have carbon with eight valence electrons. Okay, it's happy. Nitrogen has six, so we had to add those. We had to add two more, um, and that gives nitrogen eight. So now uh, hydrogen has two, carbon has eight, 
nitrogen has eight, everybody's happy. Now there's another way we can indicate bonds rather than just using this pair of electrons, which is our covalent bond. And that is to use what's called a structural formula, where instead of this pair indicating a bond, we just use a, a line. And that line means the same thing. The line means it's a covalent bond. We're sharing two electrons. Sharing two electrons, sharing two electrons. Here these are unshared. They're just called lone pairs on the, on the uh, oxygen. So here's some structural examples of the one we just did, right? We have one bond here between the C and the H and a triple bond between the C and the N. And then these two are lone pairs. They're hanging out by themselves. They're not involved in the bonding. Same thing here, right? We have an H and a C and an H and a C and a double bond to the O and then two lone pairs. So this is how we would do struct. This is a, how we would use a structural formula. Now we're going to talk about coordinate covalent bonding, and then we'll talk about resonance structures and then some exceptions to the octet rule. So what is a coordinate covalent bond? Well, that's when one atom donates both electrons to a covalent bond. See, normally we have one atom uh, contributes one of each. They, they each share one. So in this first bond we're going to make, carbon donates an electron, oxygen donates an electron. But as we're going to see here, um, uh, so then we're going to do it a second time. Um, and now we're going to, uh, at this point, um, carbon doesn't want to have a, a, an unpaired, you know, a, a, just a single electron. So it's going to keep its pair here. But in order to satisfy the octet rule, we need a third bond. Well, oxygen is going to donate both electrons here to make this third bond. When that happens, that's called a coordinate covalent bond because one atom donates both. Usually it's one of each, but in this case, um, the oxygen is giving up both. And we show that structurally with an arrow, and that just says, hey, this last pair came entirely from the oxygen. And so this is what it looks like. We have a triple bond between the carbon and the oxygen. We have a lone pair on this side a lone pair on this side. So most polyatomic cations and anions contain covalent and coordinate covalent bonds. Let's take a look at the sample problem. Um, so we're going to we're going to uh, write the electron dot structure of the hydronium ion, which is formed by hydrogen combining with water. And as we see, well, when this happens. The hydrogen has nothing to offer. It doesn't come with any electrons, but it still wants to pair up over here with the oxygen. And so the oxygen is going to donate both electrons to make that covalent bond. And so we would look at it, it would look like this. So oxygen with an arrow to this hydrogen, regular covalent bond, regular covalent bond, lone pair on the oxygen. Oxygen has eight. The hydrogens have two. Everybody's happy. Let's look at the electron dot structure of the sulfite ion. Um, and so we're going to make sulfur the central ion. And again, we're going to, we're going to join uh, this oxygen to the, this sulfur with a covalent bond, this one with this one with a covalent bond. And then we're going to join, uh, we're going to have a coordinate covalent bond where the sulfur donates both of its uh, electrons to this oxygen. And then since we have two extra electrons, we'll put them here and here to complete the octet on these other oxygens. So we get this shape here. That makes a stable, that makes a stable ion because it has, everything has an octet. We need those two extra electrons to make it work. And we had a, we had a, a, a coordinate bond, a coordinate covalent bond from sulfur to oxygen. Now let's talk about bond dissociation energies. This is the total energy required to break the bond between two covalently bonded atoms. If the dissociation energy is, is really high, then it's going to mean that it's, it's, very, it's usually unreactive. It takes too much energy to, uh, to perform the reaction. So here's a sample problem. Calculate the kilojoules to dissociate the bonds in a half mole of CO2. So what we do is look over here, we will 
look at the CO2 bonds, and we know we remember from before it's C double double O and C double O, so we would have to break two of these bonds um, to dissociate the, 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 the CO2. And so it would be 736 kilojoules per mole. Um, and so it would be it would be two of those, so 1472. If we if it if it was a whole mole, but we're only dealing with half a mole, so it would be 736 to disassociate two carbon uh, double bond O bonds. All right, what is resonance? Well, sometimes there's more than one valid dot diagram uh, that you can draw. So let's consider the two ways to draw the ozone molecule. Okay, well, if we look at ozone, we can draw ozone this way, with a double bond to this oxygen here on the left, or with a double bond with this oxygen here on the right. And if you think about it, there's no reason it couldn't be this or this. They're both equally plausible. And in fact, um, we, 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 you know, it, it stands to reason that it's it's a hybrid of both of these. It's if you just kind of flip these pictures back and forth, this or this, this or this, this or this, it's actually both. So that would be a resonance structure. So this is when we can't represent the compound or the molecules by a single Lewis structure. So what it is, it turns out to be an average of both structures. So if you wanted to, the reality would in reality we would blend these two Lewis structures, the double bond here and the double bond here. We basically would just take that double bond and spread it over these two single bonds. Let's look at exceptions to the octet rule. Sometimes it's impossible to satisfy the octet rule. This happens when there's an odd number of valence electrons. For example, NO2 has 17 valence electrons. The N has five, each O contributes six, the total is 17. There's no way we can bond these up with single or double bonds and, and get everybody an octet. And yet, this molecule does exist. So um, we, have to, we have to look at that as, a, as an exception to the octet rule. Electrons are small spinning electrical charges, and they can create a magnetic field. Now, when they are paired up, one up, one down, you know, poly exclusion principle, they cancel each other out because they're spinning in opposite directions. But when they're not paired, it creates a situation called paramagnetic. Um, and that is where uh, there is one or more unpaired electrons. So you can think paramagnetic, one or more unpaired electrons. And diamagnetic is just the opposite of that. Everything's paired up. Well, paramagnetic substances that contain one or more unpaired electrons are attracted to an external magnetic field, whereas diamagnetic molecules are only, that they're not attracted, they're actually weakly repelled by a magnetic field. So when you hear paramagnetic, think unpaired magnetic, attracted to magnets because it has unpaired electrons. Diamagnetic means the other one, it means they're all paired up, nothing's unpaired and it's slightly repelled by magnets because it has all paired electrons. So this is be an example. Here, everything is paired up. Pair, see, paired up, paired up, paired up. Everything's canceling out. Cancel, cancel, cancel. No unpaired spin. But here we have one, at least one unpaired electron. This has a spin that isn't being canceled out. And so in a, uh, in a magnetic field, it is going to be attracted to uh, that, that field. Now, don't confuse paramagnetism with ferromagnetism, which is the attraction of iron and cobalt and nickel to a magnetic field. That is a permanent, that is a permanent magnetism. Uh, this is just paramagnetism where it has a slight attraction uh, because of its unpaired electron configuration. Now, it is possible when we look at oxygen to write a structure where all the electrons are paired. We would just make oxygen double bond to another oxygen. But we know that's not the true structure because oxygen is paramagnetic. If it were a double bond, it would, not, it would be diamagnetic. So we know that there are unpaired electrons in oxygen. So for example, when you look at this, 
it could have a double bond here, a double pair, but it, in fact, it, it forms a single bond, and then you have two unpaired electrons. Okay, so here are the exceptions to the octet rule. One, molecules with an odd number of valence electrons. Two, molecules in which an atom has less than an octet, like boron. Or three, molecules in which an odd atom has more than an octet, like some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the row three um, atoms, uh, like, like sulfur, for example, or phosphorus. They are, they are uh, row three energy level, and they can promote some of their uh, electrons, like in the 3s and 3p, they can promote them and use the 3d. So they can make more than an octet worth of bonds. So let's look at some exceptions. So here's one where we have an odd number of valence electrons, right? Oxygen, two oxygens is six, and chlorine is seven. So 12 and seven, 19. There's no way we can distribute 19 electrons where everybody gets eight. And so we put that extra unpaired electron on the chlorine atom, the central atom. Some atoms have too few electrons to form an octet. Right? We've already seen that in the case of hydrogen. Hydrogen forms a duet. It only needs two electrons to complete the energy level. Um, beryllium and boron, they, they can vary. So here's beryllium bonding with chloride, and it's happy. It's completely happy with a quartet, just four atoms around it. Here's boron happy with a, a hex, hextet, I suppose, six. Uh, and those are just exceptions to the general octet rule. So here they are shown again in their electron structure. Elements in periods greater than period three on the periodic table have a d orbital available to them. And so there are conditions where they can expand their valence shells to accommodate more than eight electrons. So here's an example where phosphorus promotes some of its electrons to the 3D sublevel uh, because its energy levels are similar to the 3P, and it forms 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. It has 10 electrons uh, surrounding it, more than the octet. So we call that an expanded octet. So yeah, these are some, there are some, there are some exceptions that you should know about. SF4, SF6, that one has 10, one has 12 valence electrons. And this often occurs with these atoms, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and, and some others. Okay, let's go to the next section, which it talks about bonding theories. And here we're going to use what is known as VESEPR, sometimes just pronounced VESPER theory, to predict the shapes of covalently bonded now, the SEPR stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. It helps us predict the three-dimensional geometry of molecules. And the name tells us the theory, right? Valence electrons, uh, and valence shell means they're the outermost electrons. Electron pairs, they try to get as far away from each other as possible because they repel each other. So valence shell, shell so outer, outer electrons, Electron shell, electron pairs repel, repel each other. And we can use this repulsion to figure out the, the bond angles. Basically, a, a super comfortable way to do this, easy uh, way to do this, is to use balloons. If you tie two balloons together, and, and, and this, would, this would be the bond between them, uh, the electron bond, and this, this electron bond, and this electron bond, they want to get as far away from each other as possible, so they'll, they'll orient themselves 180 degrees away. This will create a linear bond. If you have a molecule, uh, an atom bonded to, to three molecules here, like three balloons, then these, this pair and this pair and this pair are all going to try to get as far away from each other as possible, and it will form what is known as a trigonal planar shape. If you have four, it will form a tetrahedron, and, and then we have obviously more complex shapes beyond that. So based on the number of pairs of valence electrons, both bonded and unbonded, we can figure out the geometry, what the expected geometry is. So we draw the, the structural formula. In this case, it's going to be four bonds. It's going to form a tetrahedron. And 
the furthest away they can get from each other is 109.5 degrees. That's the bond angles of a tetrahedron, which we know from geometry looks like this. So it's a pyramid with a triangular base. And it's the same, this is the same shape we're going to see for everything with four pairs. Whether it's four bonds or two bonds and two electron pairs or whatever. If it has four electrons that we're dealing with, for four pairs of electrons, whether it's bonds or lone pairs, we're going to have this four-sided figure, this, this, uh, this tetrahedron. So here it is using balloons, here's skinny balloons, here's fat balloons, but uh, the basic idea is that electron groups are going to get far away from each other as possible. Now there are some slight differences in some of these angles. You would expect these angles to be 109, but uh, ammonia is 107, water is 105. Uh, carbon dioxide is exactly as expected, uh, 180 degree angle. And we can explain these shapes because we have the lone pairs on the oxygen here and the nitrogen actually exert a tiny bit more uh, space. They, they, they repel a tiny bit more than a covalent bond. And so it, it distorts the angles to, to a tiny bit smaller than the expected 109 and a half. So these are the basic shapes. So if you have a central atom bonded to two others, you're going to get a linear shape. If you have a central atom bonded to three others, you're going to get a trigonal planar shape with a bond angle of 120 degrees. If you get a central atom bonded to four uh, atoms, you're going to have a tetrahedron of 109.5. If you take this tetrahedron and then you replace this bond and this bond with lone pairs, you're going to end up with a bent molecule because you'll just have these other two that are left. Um, but but they're going to be bent and, and, these other, and then, then the lone pairs are going to be where these other bonds would have been. They'll take up the other positions on the old tetrahedron. The okay, same thing here, if it happens with just if one of these is a lone pair, and then you have these other three bonds, it will look like this with a lone pair standing up here where the old tetrahedron shape used to be. So you can get really involved in all of this, but the basic the basic gist is is treat every bond or every lone pair like a separate balloon, and you will get the predicted geometry. And you can get super, super involved with all of this. But, um, and like I say, you can see what will happen if you, know, you take a tetrahedron and you, and you remove one bond and replace it with a lone pair. You get a trigonal pyramid. If you replace the, the tetrahedron with two lone pairs, you get a bent molecule, like the water molecule. If you take a trigonal planar and replace it with a lone pair, it just becomes bent. Okay, now let's talk about polar bonds and polar molecules. And this time, I'm not talking about being up at the North Pole. I'm talking about using electronegativity values to classify a bond as either nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. Remember, covalent bonding means we share the electrons, but do we share them equally? Not always. Remember, every electron is being pulled by its atom. And when electrons are shared, then the atoms engage in a tug of war between their nuclei for the available electrons. Now, if that tug of war is a complete standoff, if the molecules, if the, excuse me, if the, if the electrons are shared equally, such as in a diatomic molecule, the bond that results is known as nonpolar covalent. It, it's not favoring either molecule. It's right dead in the center. So it's not closer to one than the other. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. But what if one atom is pulling harder on the electrons than another? Why? Then you get what's known as bond polarity, unequal sharing of the electrons. So the more electronegative an atom is, the more it will pull on the electrons. It will have a stronger att attraction, and it will pull those electrons closer to itself, resulting in a slightly negative charge on the more electronegative atom. This is called a polar covalent bond, or more simply, a polar bond. So we can talk about bond polarity 
by looking at the difference in electronegativity. So we look at the electronegativity of H in an HCl bond. H has an electronegativity of 2.1. Cl has an electronegativity of 3.0. The difference is 0.9, so the bond is polar. The chlorine acquires a slight negative charge, and the hydrogen has a slight positive charge. We represent that with the Greek letter delta. We say delta plus for a slight positive charge on the hydrogen, and a delta negative for a slight negative charge on the chlorine. And they denote partial charges. There's, these are not full ions. Right? It's not a full plus one or a full negative one. It's just a partial charge. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a real partial charge nonetheless. And so this is the three different kinds of bonds you can form. If it's a nonpolar covalent bond, the chlorine are sharing the electrons equally, even Stephen. Here, the chlorine is pulling these electrons closer to the chlorine, giving the chlorine side of the covalent bond a delta negative, a slight partially negative charge. And the hydrogen side, a delta plus, a partially positive charge on the hydrogen side. If the electron negativity is, is even more dramatic than that, uh, then we get the stealing of electrons. So if you, you can actually think about these bonds as being on a continuum from a nonpolar uh, uh, bond where they're being shared equally to an unequal sharing to a sharing so unequal that the chlorine has now stolen the electron from the sodium here in this case. And this results in a full charge on the resulting. This is uh, has a full negative charge. This has a full positive charge. These are only partial charges. Again, different ways of looking at the covalent bond. We're sharing the, the electrons equally. We're sharing them unequally. They're tending towards the negative side. Now they've been stolen completely. And again, we have increased ionic character when we have when we go from covalent to polar covalent to full ionic. We can show bond polarity also by drawing an arrow towards the more electronegative atom. And Again, that this shows us the electric the, 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 uh, This shows us uh, not only the charge, but it can help us predict the type of bond that will tend to form. So, if we look at the electronegativity difference, if the range is between zero and 0.4, it forms a non-polar non covalent. Here's an example: HH. The difference there is zero. If the difference in electronegativity between the atoms is 0.4 to 0.1, it will form a moderately polar covalent molecule. A moderately covalent bond, polar covalent bond. In this case, the difference is 0.9, and so you have a slight positive charge on your H and a slight negative charge on your Cl. If the electronegativity difference is between 1 and 2, you have a very po uh, polar covalent bond. Uh, here the difference is 1.9. Once you get above equal or above 2, you essentially have an ionic bond, uh, like the sodium chloride here. And the, the electronegativity difference here is 2.1. So that's your that's your cutoff point. If it's below, if it's two or below, it's probably covalent. If it's above two, it's probably ionic. Again, this shows that it is a spectrum from nonpolar covalent to polar covalent to full ionic. This is the table, the Pauling table of electronegativities. And notice that fluorine is the most electronegative element. Oxygen is the second most. Okay, nitrogen and, and chloride, uh, uh, chlorine are, are, are the next. Uh, the least uh, electronegative is francium and cesium. So electronegativity goes from, from this part of the table up, 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 all towards fluorine. As you get closer and closer to fluorine, you get more and more electronegative. And so you're going to see um, there's, a, there's a giant uh, electronegativity neg uh, electro difference between the nonmetals on the right-hand side and the metals here on the left side, which is why they form ionic bonds, because these guys simply steal the electrons from these guys. But if it's less than two, if the difference is less than two, then you will typically have a polar bond or even a nonpolar bond if they're the same in here. Again, showing that if, if, the, if the range is, is only a little bit, you'll have a nonpolar covalent. If the range is between 0.4 and 2, you'll have 
polar covalent. If it's above that, you'll have an ionic bond. So we can use that to predict um, the bonds here. So here the difference is 0.9, moderately polar covalent. The difference between F and F is 0, nonpolar. The difference between CA and O is 2.5. We would think that would be ionic. It's above 2. Uh, is, the difference is 1.5, very polar covalent. So here, again, are some of the electronegativity values for selected atoms. Now, when we talk about polar bonds, uh, that makes, so if, if, a, if, a, if phage shield has polar bonds, it is thus a polar molecule. And, and a molecule that has two poles, right, a, a slightly negative charge on the Cl and a slightly positive charge on the H, it is called a dipole, di two poles, two poles. And we can look at the polar bonds and we can look at the effect of the polar bonds on the entirety of the molecule. And it will depend on the shape. So in this case, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And so we're going to have a, a polarity pointing towards the oxygen. But over here, we have a polarity pointing in the exact, in the exact opposite direction towards this oxygen. And remember, this is a linear molecule. So these two uh, dipoles cancel each other out across this whole molecule. So the molecule as a whole does not have polarity, even though it has two polar bonds, but those polar bonds cancel. So it has no net dipole moment. Okay? It has a dipole in this direction, dipole in this direction, but they cancel. But look, for example, in water, which is a bent molecule, you have a, a dipole going this way, a dipole going this way. And so those add together. So overall, you have a, a molecular dipole. Uh, this, this blue arrow is the sum total of these two black arrows in their vertical component. And that shows that the molecule as a whole has a net dipole. And it's going to, so it's going to have a negative part of the molecule up here and a positive part of the molecule down here on the hydrogen side. So this is a nonpolar molecule because the dipoles cancel. This is a polar molecule because the dipoles don't cancel, they add. What about this one? We have carbon, chlorine. Well, we know that there's going to be a, a, a dipole moment going towards this chlorine, towards this chlorine, towards this chlorine, this, towards this chlorine. But notice they're all going in, in opposite directions and so they will cancel out their net dipole moment is zero so even this is a even though this is a polar bond this molecule as a whole is considered nonpolar because it has no net direction of, of a dipole so you can just look at the various ways that you can you can have a net so HCl has a net dipole but this trigonal planar one cancels out this has a net dipole because it's, it's both going uh, towards the oxygen. This has a net dipole going this way. This has none. It cancels out and so on. So you can look at these. So the effect of polar bonds on the polarity of the entire molecule depends on the shape. If the shape is bent, for example, then we can get a net dipole moment, for example, in our water. And that's what we have. So water has one part of it on the oxygen side, which is slightly negative and a part on the hydrogen side, which is slightly positive. So now we're going to talk about the attractive forces that hold groups of molecules together. Now, the attractions between two separate molecules is not nearly as strong as the intramolecular attraction. So here, intramolecular means inside or between the parts of the molecule. So inside this molecule, there is a very strong covalent bond. It happens to be a polar covalent bond, but it's a strong covalent bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine. Between these two molecules, what we call intermolecular, there is a slight attraction between the two because this, mo this molecule is polar, right? It has a slightly negative end on this chlorine. Well, that's going to attract a slightly positive end on this other HCl molecule. So these two molecules are going to have a weak attraction. And so this, we're going to talk about intermolecular forces, intermolecular attraction. 
So the sharing of electrons that ties atoms together in molecules, it isolates those electrons from further interactions. And so if there were no other forces present, then all substances made up of covalently bonded molecules would be gases at every temperature. There would be no liquids. There would be no solids. Happily, we do have liquids and solids because we have what are known as intermolecular forces. Those are forces between molecules, not, the, not, not inside the molecule, but between separate molecules. And those attractive forces pull the molecules uh, in, 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 in together enough to let them form liquids and also solids. So let's talk about the IMF, the intermolecular forces. The weakest of all the forces is called London dispersion forces. Here's a picture of London Bridge. Hopefully it's not falling down. London dispersion forces produce momentary dipoles that help hold the molecules together. This is caused by the temporary shifting of the electron clouds through interactions between molecules. Uh, let's look at how that works. Um, so if you look at a helium atom, the, 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 uh, the electrons would, would tend to stay as far apart as possible, one on this side, one on this side. But it does happen that once in a while they both wind up on the same side of the atom, which would for a moment create a slightly negative charge on this one helium atom. So this side would be slightly negative because the, the two electrons are both temporarily on this side and a slightly positive this, this, would, this would be instantaneous, but it would, it would still be very real. And this instantaneous polarity um, has an effect on surrounding helium atoms. So what would happen is, once it moved over like this, it would, it would momentarily become polarized. It's a negative charge here and a positive charge here. And if there were another helium atom nearby, this instantaneously polarized helium is going to polarize and, and push the, the electrons of this other one away. So this becomes polar for just a second, and it creates a mirror polar image over here. So this polarized helium pushes the electrons over here and makes it polarized. So, and, and now that they're polarized, well, the positive part of this newly polarized helium atom can be attracted to the negative part of this previously, you know, the, the first one that got polarized. And now all of a sudden, you can have an attraction, attractive force that wasn't there before, caused by this temporary uh, uh, polarization that created a, a similar polarization. And now they can attract each other with, with this small but still real electrostatic attraction. So this is known as um, attractions between an instantaneous dipole and an induced dipole. This one became instantaneously polarized, and then it induced a dipole in a fellow helium atom. And then you could have this small electrostatic attraction. Here's what it looks like. Um, so let's see what's happening here. This one's becoming polarized. And then as it, as it moves closer to this one, it polarizes that one. And at that point, now they can attract each other. The, 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 the positive, the newly positive part of this one will attract the negative part of this one. And so we now have weak forces of attraction through this instantaneous polarization. That's London dispersion forces. These forces are present in all molecules, whether they are polar or nonpolar. So the tendency of an electron cloud to distort in this way is called polarizability, and all molecules are polarizable to some extent. The things that affect that is if the, the bigger the molecule, the more it can be polarized. So long, skinny molecules have stronger London dispersion forces. This is due to their increased surface area. So a bigger molecule will have more London dispersion forces. And this is what explains a very curious a property as we go down the halogens. Fluorine is a yellow gas. Chlorine, which is slightly bigger, is a green gas. Bromine, which is bigger yet, is a liquid. And iodine, which is bigger yet, is a solid. And, the, and, and that's 
none of these are polar, right? These are all nonpolar covalent bonds between these diatomic molecules. So the only thing that all of these molecules have is London dispersion forces. And what happens is, is even though the London dispersion forces are small, the bigger the molecule, the more uh, powerful the total net uh, attraction of the London dispersion forces are, such that when you get a big enough molecule like bromine, you can pull it out of a gas into a liquid. And here, we can pull it out of a liquid into a solid. That's completely due to London dispersion forces. So uh, that's why boiling point increases as we go down the group. As we go down, these molecules get bigger. The London dispersion forces become more powerful, pulling then these from gases to liquids into solids as we go down. Okay, our second attractive force is known as dipole interactions, and this occurs with polar molecules. Remember, London dispersion forces happen with all molecules, polar or not. That's just the instant polarizability of their electron clouds. But if you have a polar molecule, like, like water, for example, we have one part of the water molecule that is negative and another part that's, that's positive, and that negative part will attract a positive part of another molecule and vice versa. And so here's our water molecule. As we put these together, we're going to see that the negative part of one water molecule is going to be attracted to the positive part of another water molecule. And so this inter-attraction uh, okay, between these dipole uh, the dipoles of these polar molecules creates what's known as dipole interactions, dipole-dipole interactions. And those are stronger than London dispersion forces. This occurs when polar molecules are attracted to each other, slightly stronger than dispersion forces, London dispersion forces. Opposites attract, but they're not completely hooked together like ionic solids because, again, these charges are only partial charges. So again, here's HCl. There's going to be an attraction between the negative part of this molecule and the positive part of this molecule. And the sum total of that are going to be these dipole-dipole interactions. So molecules with permanent dipoles are attracted to each other just like you'd expect because the, po the positive ends orient towards the negative ends and they all start attracting each other. Opposites attract. A third kind of bonding is known as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a special kind of dipole-dipole interaction. And it only happens with when hydrogen is bonded to three atoms, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And notice these are three of the most electronegative of the atoms. So when, when hydrogen is bonded to any of these three very electronegative atoms, it creates a very strong dipole. The electrons near the hydrogen are pulled virtually all, all the way away from them. And so it leaves it with a very strong positive charge. And, these, and it means in, a, in, in other molecules, these Fs, Os, and Ns of another molecule can get very, very close to that hydrogen, that kind of naked, positive, or nearly positively charged hydrogen. And that can create a very, very strong attraction. So that hydrogen is left very electron deficient. And thus it shares with something nearby, it wants to share with this positive, the, the negative part of this oxygen. So the, the hydrogen on this water molecule wants to get as close as it can to snuggle right up near this oxygen. And that creates a very, very strong uh, intermolecular force known as hydrogen bonding. So we have relatively strong hydrogen bonds between these water molecules. The picture of hydrogen bonding. So here are your the, the relative forces. You have London dispersion forces, you have dipole induced dipole. So if you have a dipole, then it can induce a, a, an instantaneous dipole in another one. So here is a non-dipole induced, right? Or an instantaneous dipole that, that induces a dipole in something else. Here, if you have a permanent dipole, it can induce dipoles in others in, in, in non-polar molecules. Or you can have the interaction between two polar molecules, and the best example of that, or the strongest example of that, is, is hydrogen bonding in polar molecules. And then you can have ions uh, reacting with dipoles. And an ion has a full charge, so it's a reaction to a dipole that's going to be even stronger. Of our intermolecular forces, they go from London dispersion to dipole-induced dipole, to dipole-dipole, to hydrogen bonding, to ion.
Though most molecular bonds and molecules are not very solid, that is, they have lower melting points, um, there is a special category of molecular solids that has a very high melting point. And these are known as network solids. Diamond is perhaps the best example uh, of this. And, and remember, in, 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 the, the, you know, in our differences here between ionic compounds and covalent compounds, usually ionic compounds have the high melting points, and covalent compounds usually have the low melting points. But it happens that some of these molecules, particularly carbon and silicone, they can form a bunch of covalent bonds, a, a whole network of covalent bonds to form a network solid. And so here, for example, is the tetrahedron shape of the carbons that make up a diamond, and they form a very, very strong, rigid uh, network of tetrahedrons, which is why diamonds are so hard. Uh, this is also uh, similar, similar in graphite, which is also made of carbon, but instead of having a, uh, a tetrahedron network uh, that's all bonded together, we have layers, these, these uh, carbon forms, layers, and these are all rigidly bonded, um, but, but these layers can shift with respect to one another, which is, which is why you can write with a pencil and which was why graphite is used as a lubricant, because it can, these can slip and slide with respect to each other. So those are two interesting exceptions to the general rule that molecules have low, um, low melting points. And that's it. Thanks for your time.